Well, thank you, uh, Your Worship, for that, uh, uh, those opening remarks. And I endorse uh, uh, everything you've said, particularly about the uh, relationship stuff. These are not on my notes. They are, it is always difficult. Uh, and, you know, I think it's worth knowing that what's reported is not always uh, the discussion that's actually going on. And uh, I've been unashamed in recently having uh, meetings between myself and uh, Bob and his councillors uh, to give us an environment where we can have that robust discussion. Uh, and frankly, it's like uh, any of you in your businesses uh, st sitting in the middle of the square with everybody around you listening in uh, would present, I think, some problems. And we face that same situation. So uh, the informal arrangement is, is, I think, very, very good and it does lead to much stronger decisions in the long term. I want to thank uh, Forte Health uh, for hosting us on the site today. The development is behind us, uh, quite a significant thing. Uh, I want to thank the Chairman, Peter Davidson, David Shackleton, Andrew Vincent, Simon Jones, uh, Rowan Shooten and uh, Richard Driver who will join us here today as well. Um, this is going to tie in very, very closely to the Avon River Precinct, which is just out to uh, your right. Uh, your left, my right, and uh, uh, it would be obviously a very restful place for people to uh, engage in some uh, presumably uh, smaller surgical sort of operations, but um, nonetheless a great adjunct to the uh, hospital that we have. Can I um, uh, just note that we are here in the red zone today, uh, and it's been called a red zone because of uh, the demolition. Uh, what we were wanting to do from today on is refer to it as the rebuild zone, uh, the cordons themselves are going to come in uh, progressively over the months ahead uh, and you can see that there is very significant uh, activity going on uh, throughout this part of the town and that's only going to grow throughout the year. First today I'd like to uh, just spend a little time reminding us some of the things that we have done over the past two years and in, do in so doing I look out on the audience and see so many faces who are very very deeply involved and committed uh, either in agencies that are of the state or of the council uh, or more largely here today, the private sector who are just getting on with the job of doing what needs to be done to put the city uh, back together and we're deeply appreciative of that. 2012 was a particularly challenging year and if you go back to December of 2011 as we all sort of settled down to the idea of a Christmas break, I think the city was very much uh, thrown into a little bit of confusion over the 5.3 earthquake that we had on the 23rd of December. And it had, a, I think, an effect that was not only, um, you know, the, the unsettling nature of it, but also uh, the fact that uh, people did start to question, well, look, we've got through so much, how do we keep on going? And uh, obviously, the keeping on going part did happen, uh, and we've now had over 10,000 aftershocks, 51 of those above magnitude 5 on the earthquake. And people. Uh, I think at that time we were wondering uh, just when it was all going to end. We have now gone through a full year uh, of um, no earthquakes over magnitude 5 uh, on the Richter scale. And if there was a piece of wood around, I'd r quickly run up and, and uh, tap it. But uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is rely on the science all the way through this event. And the scientists told us uh, that the forecasts would give us some of these events uh, over that period of time and I have to tell you that it has been incredibly accurate uh, so far. And so we do still have a risk here but that risk's reducing all of the time. And we are now at a point where the probability or possibility of uh, an earthquake over five on the Richter scale is below 3%. So we've uh, come a very long way. We have though had uh, a, tr a tremendous loss of buildings throughout the city as you can see and we do have to learn from uh, the event as much as we uh, can. Older buildings that remain uh, need to be strengthened for future events and in the residential sector what we have found is that building standards worked well, we didn't get collapses but we can improve on those. An important lesson from the earthquakes is that uh, a structure is only as good as the platform it's built on. And land uh, and foundations are key factors in determining survival of any structure. Insurance for residential land uh, is unavailable in other parts of the world, but uniquely available in New Zealand. The Earthquake Commission was therefore in quite a unique position to be able to make the assessments that were necessary for us uh, to go and make decisions about uh, where it was safe to build in the city. And Canterbury will benefit from that knowledge for, I think, decades to come. 
we were able to, in June of 2011, quite confidently say that there were parts of the city uh, that were no longer suitable uh, for residential occupation and to determine that they were red zones. Uh, the designation of the red zone was based on that information gathered by uh, EQC and their very, very extensive team of engineers uh, brought in largely from the private sector who collaborated extremely well. And the Crown made a voluntary offer to purchase properties in those most severely damaged areas, as you know. And we chose the pre earthquake rating valuation, and that in the end will cost taxpayers in excess of a billion dollars. But what it's allowed those homeowners to do is to uh, more easily uh, choose to embrace the change that this event has forced upon them. Of the 7,207 property owners who've received a Crown offer, over 6,500 have signed a sale and purchase agreement. And some of those uh, 7,200 properties are in the Port Hills area where they have some months yet to make a decision. Over 5,000 properties uh, have had their offer time expire and the acceptance rate for those has been 99.8%. And I think that's quite a remarkable achievement. Zoning of the land will give that longer term confidence and I'm proud of the work uh, that has been done and pleased also that it's been done in a very systematic manner. Uh, I was regularly asked to hurry decisions uh, and what has become clear in retrospect is that good decisions uh, that took a few weeks longer, that were hard to hold off uh, but did require a little bit of extra investigation uh, were the right things to do uh, in the long term uh, for the city. Further assessment uh, of those zones has been done by engineers to see that there is a clear difference between land that was zoned red and lands that have been put in one of the technical categories for rebuilding. And that includes the 14% of the residential land in Christchurch classified as Category 3, known as TC3. TC3 is a performance standard uh, which will ensure that the event, in the event of a major earthquake in the future, the house built on that site uh, would resist the earthquake's damage as much as any house built on TC1 land. And that requires stronger foundations and I'm looking forward this afternoon to attending the pouring of a concrete uh, foundation, uh, a new design designed specifically for use on TC3 land. There has been understandable frustration from TC3 residents as insurers worked to understand how that land designation might affect their exposure to this event uh, to these sort of events in the future. Uh, but that is subsiding as people learn more and confidence is growing in TC3 as builders are able to deliver those solutions. Land values haven't suffered, uh, sales of land and houses are regular. TC3 was just another one of those curveballs that we've had to deal with uh, throughout the period of these events unfolding. The elimination of residential red zones and the loss of building stock below building code performance standards and now the requirement to adhere to very high standards uh, means such a quake in the future would have nowhere near the effect on our city uh, as the events uh, starting in February 22nd did have. And New Zealand is a country that has very high levels of insurance. Uh, what we found in the red zone areas is that less than 1%, uh, in fact probably less than 0.5 of a percent of residential owners had no insurance. It's quite unique. And what that can uh, do is, is lead to some of the choices that we're able to make. And further, we'll be able to demonstrate, because of the way we've worked with private insurers, uh, that future insurance contracts for Christchurch uh, will be very viable. That will ultimately keep insurance affordable and ensure that significant cover is available uh, during this recovery period. The CBD blueprint, I might just add there that one of the a lot of criticism is levelled at insurers and I fully understand the frustration that people have in both the residential and commercial sectors. But what needs to be appreciated, I think, is that insurance companies could easily have decided to withdraw earthquake cover after the 4th of September event. They didn't. They stuck with the city, they stuck with their clients and they've stuck with them uh, as this event has unfolded uh, and uh, have recognised that they need to honour the, the uh, contracts uh, that they have in place. Certainty about the uh, shape of the city is always important 
And in uh, July of 2012, we were able to un uh, unravel, uh, sorry, unveil the CBD blueprint. Uh, the city had already unraveled itself at that stage. So we were able to unra unveil the CBD blueprint to give some of that certainty. And the Christchurch Central City Development Unit was formed to create a consistent, coherent plan uh, to redevelop the central city. It was also charged with leading the core government sector developments and attracting the private sector investment alongside it. The first task was to deliver that blueprint in 100 days. And I need to acknowledge that that was after the Christchurch City Council had engaged in a very, very uh, significant uh, public process uh, to, un to understand what the residents of uh, this part of Greater Christchurch wanted from the CBD. And taking that uh, material uh, bringing together uh, people from the council and from Sarah and from outside, uh, we were able to put together in 100 days a plan that I think will endure uh, through, through the decades ahead. And there was recognition that with 70% of the buildings demolished, uh, we could build a 21st century here and not a replica of the past. It has to be a city that's attractive to live in, to work in and to play in. And we now have that bold vision for a centre uh, that is not constrained by the grid layout of uh, a London design from the 1840s, but instead uh, a plan based on thousands of local ideas, uh, a design that was created in this city by people who live in this city. And that new Christchurch is founded uh, uh, on the best of urban design principles. It would be a pedestrian friendly city. The frames link with the Avon River precinct to provide transport corridors for cyclists and pedestrians. It affirms and enhances the leafy green garden city Christchurch has always been known for. The public transport system is integrated into design of that central city. The new bus interchange will make transport into the city much easier. The motorway system will lead to productivity gains for Canterbury business, but also require less fuel to get products to market. The cold, drafty buildings uh, that populated much of Christchurch were hard to heat and in many cases uneconomic to occupy. More modern codes <coughs> integrate environmentally friendly building practice into new buildings. Not only is it better for the environment, it's an economic benefit through lower operating costs. Any suggestion that sustainability has been overlooked is not only ill-informed but ridiculous. Many people have remarked that before the earthquakes the city was struggling to attract people and it was reflected in a decline in retail in hospitality in its centre. When formulating the blueprint, uh, designers knew that both local and central government would need new buildings. We knew those buildings would impact on decisions made by investors. For example, hoteliers were anxious to know where the convention centre would be placed. The location of courts and police would impact on the legal fraternity. These core assets are the anchors around which a city develops. To give, to give effect to the plan, we have extensive purchasing uh, plans in progress to accumulate necessary land holdings. This plan has restored the supply of demand balance in the commercial property market. And while the price of land has fallen uh, following the earthquakes, it's not collapsed, as could have been expected uh, and was witnessed in most other disaster areas around the world. This is a reflection, I think, of the confidence the city can be successfully rebuilt rebuilt and the realistic returns uh, that are likely to be generated from new buildings. There will always be arguments about market price of land, but it's worth noting that the Crown's approach to Christchurch is much more generous than a previous government took following the Napier earthquakes. The date set for addressing compensation for Napier landowners was the 4th of February 1931, the day after the earthquakes. We have underpinned the market value of land and are taking out the excess supply. And this allows development to be concentrated, creating a tight core to build out from, rather than encouraging an inconsistent patchwork of development. This is one of the reasons the CBD plan has generated considerable confidence in the future of Christchurch. Large numbers of expressions of interest have been received for the Convention Centre precinct and other anchor projects in the CBD with a mixture of domestic and international participants competing at the centre for a revived tourism industry in Canterbury. We know from expressions of interest that high quality new hotels will greatly enhance the capacity for tourism and business travel. 
visitors to Christchurch would be attracted by new cultural and entertainment attractions. The plan envisages a high quality performing arts and entertainment complex somewhere across Victoria Square from the Convention Centre. New sporting facilities will make Christchurch a destination for large sporting events. These projects are important elements of making Canterbury a great place to live. This is why the Avon River precinct we see as a core anchor project. I want to take the opportunity now to say a few words about a very special project that will occur just across the river uh, behind me, or actually in front of me, I think, um, and acknowledge the presence in the audience of Andy Simons, retail director of the BNZ. I'm pleased to announce today uh, that the BNZ has come on board as principal sponsor of The Amazing Place. This will be one of the best, uh, if not the best, children's playgrounds anywhere. And we know it will have what children want because they will be asked to design it. Children have endured a great deal in our city, uh, as all residents have over the past two years. And not only do they deserve recognition for that, uh, but also need to feel some ownership, an aspect, an aspect of the new city. Information packs have gone out to all schools across Greater Christchurch and winners of the Amazing Place competition will be announced in the third term of this year. So again, uh, the BNZ, thank you for your uh, supporting of this project uh, and for your indication of taking a long-term stake in this city. By creating a corridor of green space for people to interact and enjoy in the urban environment, the river will become a vibrant community element of the city just as the Arrow in Melbourne and the waterfront in Wellington is on a daily basis. Outside the anchor projects, private sector investment is thriving. Prior to the earthquakes, Cashel Mall uh, had replaced most of its high-end fashion with discount goods stores and small retailers. Today we have major investors competing to build their visions in that space. And I have to say, some of the way in which people have stepped up uh, has been quite extraordinary. I want to acknowledge Anthony Goff for some of the leadership that he's shown in uh, getting things moving picking up on the visions that Cantabrians spoke of in that uh, share an idea uh, uh, effort uh, and I think very shortly to present to the city uh, some very, very sharp private development proposals. As you know, the earthquakes also tore apart the horizontal infrastructure, the roads, the wastewater, the stormwater and the drinking water. Typically that infrastructure takes decades to develop as a city grows and expands. And we have the challenge of building out that infrastructure while maintaining service to 180,000 households and significant commercial premises. That work will continue for at least five years and will leave a legacy of the best designed and mapped infrastructure in this country, if not in the world. Pipes and sewers are laid with modern technology. And it's interesting to note that repairs and new work that was done between September of 2010 and February of 2011 was largely undamaged by the major earthquakes in February and following. Above those pipes lie the roads that carry people about their daily business. Wearing my other hat as Transport Minister, I can point to the recently completed Stage 1 of the Southern Motorway, most of that built post-September. People regularly report to me that their journeys that once took 40 minutes now take 15 minutes. Others report that they enjoy driving on that road because it's flat, unlike many others that they have to drive over around Christchurch. So we do have freight flowing more freely into the port of Littleton. And while that point, port has suffered major damage and repair work will take some time, Littleton itself will be a major reclamation, we'll see a major reclamation, or pretty much has I think Peter, seen a major reclamation of land <coughs> built from the rubble of the CBD. And Hopefully we can get a little more rubble to get a little more land. In regard to the CBD, uh, that's really a summary of where we're at uh, and why we've approached things the way we have. But I know that a lot of you will be interested in the when. It's the question that everybody asks. Uh, and as has been the case with uh, every major work program launched in Canterbury since September 2010, there is a process of identifying the means to tackle an issue, gathering the resources, beginning the work and beginning the work program to get it to full capacity. All the while everyone is anxious uh, for things to get going. Uh, that was the case with the Fletcher EQR Managed Homes Repair Program and the Winter Heat Program of 2011. It was the case with the Skirt Program 
and the replacing and repairing of horizontal infrastructure. It's also the case with the residential land zoning, which requires the aggregation and painstaking assessment of all those homes that I spoke of earlier. So people will never stop asking, uh, why isn't it going faster? <clears throat> the frustrating answer, especially when it comes to building programs, is everything does take time to ramp up. Despite the early angst, the winter heat program, though, installed over 15,000 devices into damaged homes in a little over six months. And the number of devices installed is now in excess of 18,000. It also carried out 50,000 emergency home repairs, enabling people to remain in their homes waiting for the more substantial repair down the track. And on those more substantial repairs, the EQC, EQR Managed Repair Program has now repaired in excess of 50, uh, sorry, 31,000 homes uh, with a cost, a cost of in excess of $500 million. Uh, sorry, $50 million. Uh, that can't be right. I'll read this properly. The EQ uh, Managed Repair Program is now thousands of contractors regularly billing over $50 million a month and has permanently repaired 31,000 homes. If those earlier figures I gave you were right, uh, Bill English should be dancing a jig. Uh, <coughs> and Skirt has completed over $90 million worth of work and has around $300 million worth of work underway, which sees local contractors largely invoicing about $1.5 million a day. I point all out this out because uh, there have already been impatient queries about when will the CBD be rebuilt. This is entirely, I think, understandable and in many ways encouraging. Even work as we are, working as we are to streamline processes around tendering, design and other elements of getting major building projects off the ground, including consenting, there are many, many ducks to get in line before work can begin. Uh, but <coughs> a bit like the process of courting a spring, building up uh, that tension before it's released, uh, the work to get that uh, big start is well underway and you can see the ramp up of it uh, in most directions from where we're sitting today. In the East Frame, the Avon River Precinct detailed design work has commenced at the same time as the Crown is acquiring properties to make that happen. By August this year we should have that land acquisition completed uh, and the early construction on the river should be underway. In fact, early construction of the Avon River Precinct we hope will begin in April uh, with uh, the project being completed uh, mid to late uh, next year. The Convention Centre Precinct is a very important one for the city, not the least because settling on the site has already given the direction for hotel and hospitality investors uh, and we are keen to get them committed. Last year, the CCDU called for expressions of interest in building the Convention Centre Precinct and this month parties who responded will be advised of the outcome. Whoever is chosen, uh, the outcome for procuring this huge project uh, will be uh, that the Crown will get all of the land in ownership uh, about six months from today and clearance uh, will be well underway by that point. A month later in September the Crown will own uh, all the land necessary to build the Metro Sports Facility uh, with finalised design and early construction planned to begin soon after. I might point out that the Christchurch City Council is uh, a very, very significant uh, partner in all of these anchor projects. And when I say what the Crown is doing, essentially we're acquiring the land uh, and then we've got to work out yet uh, uh, fully uh, how we fund what goes on top of them. Uh, the health precinct in the South Prime is also making good progress with a request proposal for master plan services now closed and master plan, a master plan contract due to commence next month. I want to acknowledge David Mates who's here today who I think has done an outstanding job in moving all of the resources of government uh, in the health sector uh, to get focused on uh, committing uh, something over $600 million to what will be the, the biggest a hospital project or rebuild uh, ever committed in New Zealand and that's going to give us absolutely top quality services uh, as a result of that. Um, I want to say that I'm extremely impressed and heartened by the response of the private sector and I said before e earlier in the retail sector I won't labour that again uh, but fair, enough, fair to say I think that only seven months after we've launched the Christchurch Central Recovery Plan 
uh, we have outlined development plans to cover that entire precinct. Landowners and developers have spent a lot of time and money developing their plans for which we are very, very grateful and encouraged. And the team at CCDU, uh, in conjunction with the council, will consider those next steps so that we can proceed with a great deal of haste. I also want to make it very clear today, uh, and many of you here will be acutely aware of this, uh, though others from further afield I suspect are not, there is already massive private and public sector investment in Christchurch City. In September 2012, there was $341 million of residential building work underway in Canterbury, a 34% increase on the previous year. And that statistic is already six months old. Total building underway in, work, uh, in Canterbury in September of 2012 was worth $603 million. That was 46% up on the previous year. And there are so many more to come with over $3.9 billion worth of building consents in Canterbury issued between September 2010 and December 2012. Just the three months leading up to Christmas, almost 170,000 cubic metres of ready mix concrete was produced in Canterbury uh, and laid as part of the rebuild program. And that is a very, very large increase and one of the biggest concrete pours uh, over that for such a period ever seen in New Zealand. Not surprisingly then, we've seen a 32% increase in the number of employees in the construction sector in Canterbury. And it's uh, not just the building sector where people are finding jobs. The most recent Household Labour Force survey revealed 16,000 new jobs in Canterbury over the last, in Christchurch in fact, over the last uh, year. So our recovery is based on strong and sound foundations. I think we've taken decisions to reflect uh, future risk and position Greater Christchurch to be a strong and su uh, sustainable economy. This will create jobs and prosperity uh, so that people can enjoy the quality public services that will be available here and the lifestyle this part of New Zealand offers. In September I laid, a, laid out a challenge saying that in five years time uh, I hope that the event that defines the lives of this generation of Cantabrians is not so much the earthquakes but more being part of recreating uh, a magnificent new city. And I believe we've laid the foundations to create the best small city in the world. My parting message to you today is that while the scale of development in Christchurch uh, and the Canterbury region is unprecedented. And while uh, we'd all like things to be done yesterday, we have an exciting but realistic vision uh, for what Christchurch can become uh, and orderly, well-considered processes will make that happen. We have a very bright future ahead of us. As the global economy recovers, Canterbury will be well positioned for high productivity exports driven by economic growth. Alongside uh, what we're wanting to see in the city is further development of our potential in the plains and in particular greater protection for the water resources that offers Canterbury so much for the future. Uh, and I think I'd also like to finish by saying what great people we have here in Canterbury. I said at numerous public uh, gatherings in the past two and a half years, the strongest legacy for me is how Christchurch has responded to these quakes uh, and the way in which everyone from all works of life is now going about their daily lives in fashions that are a little different to what they might have expected and working in places that might be a little more compromised than they would prefer. People are going to work in different directions and making all sorts of choices about their family lives that are a direct consequence of what we've gone through here. So it is, I think, uh, to the credit of the city and the people of the city that we are in an incredibly good position when you consider our position compared to many others who suffered similar disasters throughout the world. We're on track uh, for a great future. Thanks very much.